All right, so let's uh, talk about the nervous system and diseases of the nervous system. Um, diseases of the nervous, uh, well, the nervous system itself is divided anatomically into two parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, with the central nervous system consisting of the brain, and spinal cord, the peripheral nervous system consisting of everything else. Uh, generally speaking, the nervous system does not have any natural microbes. Um, with a few caveats, like the CNS is, is, is probably the most protected part of your body and should not have any microbes in it. Full stop. Um, your peripheral nervous system is embedded in a lot of your tissues. And for the most part, those tissues don't have microbes embedded in them. Um, but nerve endings can occur very, very, very close to your body's barriers. And so uh, those nerve endings are often going to be at least peripherally exposed to some microbes, even though it would be improper to say that there is any microbe that naturally colonizes it. Um, the most, uh, not quite. Um, probably the most severe, under normal circumstances, the most severe infections of the nervous system are going to be infections of the central nervous system. And infections of the nervous system, central nervous system consist primarily of meningitis and encephalitis, with meningitis being an infection of the meninges, which is a tissue layer that surrounds the central nervous system and encephalitis being an infection and inflammation of the brain tissue itself. And these two things often occur together enough that they are collectively referred to as meningioencephalitis. Uh, since your central nervous system is so well protected, how would it ever get infected? Well, there's a few different ways. One, it could be through some sort of injury, uh, possibly intentional through, say, surgery uh, or other medical procedures, possibly through breaks in the bones that cause damage to the meninges itself. That can give organisms access into the CNS. Um, you can also take the long route, infect the peripheral nervous system, and then travel up the nerve and into the brain through the nerve itself. Um, or there are some things that can infect and kill the cells of the meninges and like basically get to the meninges from the outside because the meninges is the protective layer. And uh, they can uh, uh, kind of like bore their own way in. Mm, probably most organisms that cause meningitis uh, start off infecting something else and then travel typically through the blood into the meninges and from there into the brain. Uh, these I am going to go over in lecture in some detail. So I'm gonna kind of scooch past them here, but I'm gonna cover them briefly. So um, meningitis can be, well, it's an inflammation of the meninges of the brain. So anything that can cause inflammation, it could be bacterial, it could be viral, it could be fungal, it could be protozoal. It could actually be due to just like damage because damage can cause inflammation. There's even a few cases in which it's auto-inflammatory. Um, in any case, it 
presents with some similar symptoms no matter what the source of the infection is. Uh, and that's due to the damage being done to the brain and the swelling caused uh, within the central nervous system. Um, I'll be talking about bacterial and viral meningitis and I'll probably mention a little bit about fungal and um, protozoal meningitis in class, but I won't be talking about it here. Bacterial meningitis is typically considered to be more severe. Um, the symptoms are more severe. Uh, when it kills, it typically kills faster. Um, but it is also more treatable under most circumstances. The symptoms of bacterial meningitis, sudden high fever, um, meningeal inflammation, which is difficult to tell without a, uh, like, CAT scan or an MRI. Um, so... Uh, splitting headache, and when I say splitting, I mean it actually physically feels like your head is about to split apart. Um, it often starts as an upper respiratory infection, uh, progressing to meningitis from there, and um, so uh, disorientation. Um, confusion, loss of ability, orientation to person and place, uh, behavioral changes, potentially coma and death, uh, pain on forward flexion of the neck is a particular sign of meningitis. All of these are typically more severe in a case of bacterial meningitis than viral or fungal. Uh, there are several different bacteria that can infect the meninges. The most common in adults is Streptococcus pneumoniae. Uh, that, that accounts for the majority of um, of of adult bacterial meningitis cases. The most feared and dangerous is Neisseria meningitides, a gram-negative diplococci. Um, it can, on occasion, go epidemic, um, transferring itself very rapidly from person to person through droplet transmission, and uh, it can kill within a very short time period from the first onset of symptoms. Um, so even though it's fairly rare, it is the most uh, severe, serious, and fast-acting form. Hemophilius, influenzae, listeria, uh, monocytogenes, and streptococcus uh, agalcti um, are less common, um, but, uh, you know, still, still of a significant number of cases. Um, uh, strep, uh, agalte is typically acquired during birth and results in infantile, uh, meningitis. Listeria is a foodborne illness. Uh, the others, H. influenzae, strep pneumoniae, um, and Neisseria meningitides, uh, are all typically upper respiratory at first and transmitted through droplet transmission or fomites. Here you can see uh, Neisseria meningitides and strep pneumoniae. 
Um, both of them are diplococci. Uh, Nasseria is gram negative, and strep is, of course, gram positive. Hemophilus influenzae is a um, pleomorphic, usually bacilli, uh, gram negative. Um, it can be varies between being a short rod to a long rod. So the epidemiology. Um, strep pneumoniae, the most common cause of bacterial meningitis, is a common native flora for people to have. It's present in the throat of about 75% of people. Um, it might not always be present. Some people have transient populations. Some people have resident populations. Uh, but either way, it's there. Uh, it's the also the most common cause of bacterial pneumonia. Um, not generally spread by casual contact. Uh, at least S. pneumoniae isn't. Um, and usually will infect after a another disease or something that lowers your immune response. Meningococcal meningitis, that's nasarial meningitis, can become epidemic, especially in crowded, panicky situations. Diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. Uh, we talked about the symptoms of meningitis um, and... If you go into the emergency room with, and tell them that you have the worst headache that you've ever had in your life and it feels like something is about to burst out of your head, that's a good way to get a lumbar puncture or sometimes referred to as a spinal tap. Uh, they insert a needle and take a look at your cerebrospinal fluid. Um, uh, uh, lumbar puncture and examination of the cerebrospinal fluid is considered the definitive test for uh, meningitis. Um, generally speaking, bacterial meningitis will be usually quite cloudy, and under a microscope you will be able to see the bacteria um, and potentially culture them, although you're not going to want to wait on the culture before you start treating. Uh, as far as treatment goes, if you suspect the case of bacterial meningitis, you probably treat with a broad spectrum um, bactericidal antibiotic fast because Meningococcal meningitis can go from onset of symptoms to death in an hour. So it's important that it be treated very, very quickly. Um, once you've identified the species, so um, strep pneumoniae is, is easily treated with most beta-lactams. Um, H influenzae and some of the other ones might require cephalosporin or something like that. Um, but generally speaking, you want high doses of intravenous antimicrobials. Uh, there are vaccines available for strep pneumoniae and H influenza um, and for Neisseria meningitides. The strep pneumoniae uh, vaccine is commonly also given for pneumonia um, and is usually recommended for people over like 55 uh, or who have a health risk and it's pretty effective. Um, the Neisseria meningitides vaccine I believe is typically not given except in cases where there is a feared epidemic. I don't believe that it produces long-lasting immunity, but if given before symptoms or shortly before infection occurs, it can lead to a much higher survival rate. Viral meningitis. Um, 
The symptoms are going to be similar to those of bacterial meningitis, though often less severe in degree. Um, typically, it has abrupt onset, characterized by fever, usually a milder fever, but not always. Uh, severe headache, above or behind eyes, again, a feeling of a splitting headache. Light sensitivity, nausea and vomiting, either from the pain or from disorientation. Um, often again, not always, but often starts as an upper respiratory infection. So it can also happen with sore throat, chest pain, swollen parotid glands, and occasionally skin rash. There are a bunch of different viruses that can theoretically cause back, or viral meningitis. And the specific symptoms uh, are going to be dependent upon the, what the causative agent is. Uh, speaking of, uh, of which, um, there are a lot of viruses that can cause meningitis. Um, many of them are small non-enveloped RNA viruses. The enterovirus and picornovirus family are common. Uh, there are at least half of uh, viral meningitis cases. Um, but other viruses like, say, um, well, rabies, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, measles, various other viruses uh, can also cause viral meningitis. Pathogenesis usually begins with a throat infection, progressing to the lymphoid tissue, the bloodstream, from there infecting the cells of the meninges and causing inflammation. Uh, epidemiology. Um, there's a bunch of different viruses that can cause it. Some of them are fairly environmentally stable, capable of surviving in chlorinated water. Um, People may spread the disease through droplet transmission, coughing, and things like that. There are also some viruses that are eliminated in the feces and can be transmitted via fecal-oral route. Uh, mumps, which can sometimes, doesn't always, but can sometimes cause viral encephalitis, uh, is transmitted via respiratory droplets. Diagnosis, as with uh, bacterial meningitis, uh, final diagnosis is done via spinal tap. Typically, um, the general rule is that if, if the CSF is cloudy, it's bacterial. If it's clear, it's viral. That's not 100% always the case. Um, most bacterial infections will be fairly cloudy and will have bacteria visible in the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, viral infections will usually not have bacteria visible in the cerebrospinal fluid um, and will range from being a little cloudy to pretty clear. Um, the cloudiness and viral meningitis is mostly caused by uh, a heightened level of white blood cells rather than the presence of bacterial cells. So if you examine the fluid underneath a microscope, you should see, um, if you see bacteria, it's bacterial. And with bacterial, because they're very pyogenic, you'll also see a huge number of white blood cells. With viral meningitis, you'll usually see an elevated but not astronomical level of white blood cells, no bacteria. And um, in healthy cerebrospinal fluid, it should be pretty crystal clear, like a few white blood cells and a few bits of cell debris, but it should be pretty, pretty clear. Uh, as far as prevention goes, um, Hand washing, avoidance of crowded swimming pools, which are known to be vectors of transmission. Um, there's 
a whole bunch of different viruses that cause it, so there's no one vaccine that's going to prevent it. Many things that cause or can cause uh, viral meningitis, like measles and mumps, are preventable by vaccines, but the most common causes, such as the Coxsackie virus and Echovirus, do not have um, uh, vaccines against them. Treatment is typically going to be supportive care and anti-inflammatories. Uh, there's no real good way to tell what exactly what virus is causing meningitis. If we did know, there's probably nothing we could do about it because you can't treat it with antibiotics. Uh, so mostly cases of viral meningitis are not fatal. Um, generally speaking, you just rest, good supportive care, plenty of fluids, and you monitor the, um, the progression of the disease. If it starts to get to the point where the inflammation in the brain is causing severe symptoms and potentially damage, uh, then you may need to treat with anti-inflammatories, bring the inflammation down, prevent the brain from getting damaged. Uh, and other than that, you just wait. So it can take weeks sometimes before it clears up. Depends on the agent. Botulism. So botulism is a nervous system infection of the peripheral nervous system. It's technically an intoxication rather than an infection uh, because the bacteria itself is neither necessary nor common to the infection. Uh, botulism uh, is most commonly considered a foodborne ailment, um, though under certain circumstances it can infect infants and wounds, in which case, in both of those cases, it produces an actual infection. Uh, the agent is Clostridium botulinum, a gram-positive rod that produces endospores um, and is commonly found in the soil. Some strains, many strains, produce various neurotoxins, and the botulism neurotoxin, Botox, uh, will cause flaccid paralysis. Uh, flaccid paralysis works by preventing muscle contraction, so the muscles go completely limp, as opposed to a tetanic paralysis, where um, the, the paralysis is achieved by like all of the muscles tensing. Botulism um, is currently fairly rare, uh, due to good food care techniques and regulations. Um, there's about 50 cases of foodborne and wound botulism per year in the U.S. Uh, infant botulism is pretty common, but is the least severe. Uh, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. So. Um, most cases of foodborne botulism are from, like, homemade flavored oils um, or things like that. Um, usually ones that have some sort of allium in them, like onion or garlic. These grow in the soil and they grow in layers. And botulism, which is a soil bacteria, can get trapped in between the layers of these roots as they form. And, um, and that, that's not particularly dangerous. The bacteria by itself is not usually dangerous. Uh, but it will, um, it's a strict anaerobe. 
So it requires an anaerobic environment to grow um, and in which to, it, it's an endospore former, so it can survive oxygen, but it doesn't grow in oxygen. Um, in an anaerobic environment, it will produce its toxin at the right temperature. And uh, so water is usually not anaerobic enough for it, but oil is. So let's say you, you get some garlic and you like chop it up and you're gonna make some garlic infused oil and give it out for Christmas. Not that this is something that I've done before. Um, and you know, the, the garlic might have little bits of, of bacteria in it and there could be little micro droplets of water that get surrounded by the oil. The oil prevents oxygen from getting it. So you're making these little teeny tiny little spaces that are perfect for the botulism bacteria to grow in. Um, and things like that, cases where you have like some sort of airtight container, like an oil or, or also alternately canned goods. Um, there was an outbreak of botulism linked to canned meats back at the beginning of the 19th century or uh, beginning of the 20th century. Um, and uh, so that sort of like long-term storage at like room temperature of uh, in an airtight container is key to botulism transfer as a foodborne disease. Commercial oils usually are preserved with an acid, an acidic oil in them, and acid uh, an acidic pH will prevent the botulism bacteria from making its toxin. So, uh, and uh, commercial canned foods nowadays are uh, pasteurized at a high temperature that can kill botulism. And um, the botulism toxin, however, can be left behind. Um, but it can be destroyed by not boiling temperatures. Boiling won't destroy botulism toxin, but frying will. So if you get some homemade garlic oil and you're a little bit unsure about it, use it to fry things because that will actually get hot enough to destroy the toxin itself. Uh, infant botulism is actually a gastrointestinal disease, usually transferred through honey. Uh, many people think of honey as being naturally antibacterial, which is true to a certain extent. Bacteria don't like to grow in honey, but again, Clostridium botulinum is an endospore former, and endospores of cl uh, Clostridium can be present in honey. Infants don't have any intestinal immune system, really, to start with, and they don't really have much intestinal flora when they're very young. So if you feed an infant honey, which is apparently a thing, um, if that honey has any clostridium contamination in it, uh, the clostridium will begin to grow gastrointestinally. And uh, will cause the infant to undergo what's called failure to thrive, which means that they don't grow uh, at the proper rate, they don't put on weight, they don't develop properly, and um, it, it doesn't have its paralytic effects. It doesn't actually make its toxin when it's growing in the intestines, but it... Um, it just creates a nasty gastrointestinal disorder. Uh, that's actually technically the most um, common form of botulism in the U.S. Uh, so prevention is by destroying endospores and contaminated food, uh, by preserving food with acid to prevent the... Um, accumulation of toxin, 
You can treat uh, in infants with antimicrobial drugs. Um, and in the case of paralysis, there's an antitoxin immunoglobulin, which can be administered to... Uh, doesn't actually reverse the effects, but it can stop them from getting worse. And then you gotta keep the person alive until the effects wear off, which can take weeks to months. Here you see how the uh, botulism toxin works. It works by preventing your nerve endings from being able to release neurotransmitters, and therefore they can't stimulate the muscle cells. Rabies. Everyone's heard of rabies. Rabies is actually pretty rare. Um, at least in the United States and uh, increasingly most places. Uh, symptoms of rabies are fever, fatigue, muscle ache, and twitching, especially at the point of injury where the rabies gets in. Sore throat, nausea, those are the early symptoms. And early is a relative term here because rabies is an extremely slow acting virus. Right. It starts off as a wound infection and then it travels up to your brain by crawling up your nerve from the inside. And that can take months. So these early symptoms can begin uh, one to two months post-infection and they progress rapidly to the secondary symptoms. Once the virus reaches inside of your brain, it begins replicating in there, causing encephalitis. It bypasses the meninges by going up the nerve. Uh, agitation, confusion, hallucinations, seizure, uh, high, higher body temperature, fever, definitely, but just like a naturally warm body temperature. It amps up your um, thyroid levels. Uh, in many cases, sensitivity to light and touch, followed by uh, insanity, uh, frothing at the mouth, uh, hyperviolence, and then death. The virus is actually uh, secreted in the saliva. And the reason why rabid creatures foam at the mouth is because um, the virus causes them to uh, increase salivation, thus increasing the amount of virus present in their mouth, and it starts to shut off their throat, making it difficult to swallow. So the saliva builds up inside of their mouth all the time, and they start frothing. All of that is to make it more likely that when they bite you, some of the virus is going to actually get in. Rabies is actually not a super infective virus. Don't go tangling around with it, though. In about 50% of cases, hydrophobia occurs. That's fear of water. We're not sure exactly why this is. It's a little bit weird, but it's thought that it's due to the um, light sensitivity, right? So the inflammation in the brain makes you very sensitive to bright lights. And with water, you when, when you have water moving a little bit, you get like reflected sunlight. And it's thought that that causes intense pain. Eventually coma, and in about 50% of patients, they die within four days. Uh, the other 50% don't get to live. Rabies has darn near a 100% uh, death rate. Um, those, those other 50% just take longer than four days to die. Here you can see the rabies virus. It's a bullet-shaped virus, uh, unencapsulated. Uh, it's a member of a, uh, of the rhabdovirus family. 
Oh, sorry, it's enveloped. Enveloped single-stranded RNA. General mode of transmission is uh, by through saliva introduced into a wound. It's like theoretically possible to inhale it, but you have to have basically some sort of rabid animal, which is just like <laughs> slobbering saliva in directly into your face and you got to get like a big, you know, gulp of it into you. Usually at that point, if you've got like a rabid bear or something that's got its face that close to you, it's going to be biting you anyways. Um... So, the virus initially multiplies at the site of infection, infects a nerve, goes up to the nerve, to the brain. The key symptom of rabies, uh, diagnostically, is negri bodies, or black bodies, that form at sites of replication in the brain. They're not very useful in terms of diagnosis because you have to cut the brain apart to see them. Um, but in cases where you want to know, hey, Let's say this raccoon bit me. Is it rabid? Well, they if they can trap the raccoon, they can take its brain apart and they can look to see whether or not it's rabid. The raccoon's not going to be very much use after that, but you'll at least know. Epidemiology, it's widespread throughout... Um, uh, throughout the world, there's about 5,000 cases reported annually in the United States. Note that those are cases in animals, not in humans. Uh, the most commonly infected animal in the United States is uh, raccoons, actually. Most people think of dogs, and that certainly used to be the case. But... Um, Dogs are usually vaccinated, uh, and most cases of rabies infecting humans in the U.S. do not come from dogs. Um, they don't even come from raccoons, actually. Most human cases in the U.S. are due to contact with infected bats, because, like, if you're walking out of your house and uh, a, like, raccoon jumps out of your garbage can with, like, foamy mouth and whatnot and goes <laughs> at you, you run the heck away. Whereas um, most people don't look up very often. They don't think about bats. And if you get dive-bombed by a bat that bites you, you just think, ah, that's weird. You probably didn't even see it coming. You might not have even saw it leaving. Yeah, no idea the thing was, uh, uh, was infected. Here's the thing. We only know about cases of rabies where the person actually gets sick. So, like, if a raccoon or even a dog, you know, jumps out at you and bites you and runs away, you're going to go get a rabies shot. If a bat dive bombs you, you might not think about it until two months later when you're suddenly crazy and die. There are zero to four reported cases of... Uh, rabies in the United States annually. Um, and that's because, generally speaking, if you get bit by something and you don't know whether or not it's rabid, you usually go get a... Um, get a rabies vaccine. Only 25% have a history of dog bite. Note that that doesn't mean that you got it from the dog bite. That just means they say, hey, were you bitten by a dog any time in the last four months? And in 25% of the cases, they say yes. Now, they may also have been bitten by a raccoon, a bat, a squirrel, who knows what else. Um, but they always ask about dogs, because people like to blame them. Prevention and treatment. Proper wound care can actually do a good job towards reducing the likelihood that you'll get infected. Um, it's not a virus that easily infects people. So washing the wound thoroughly with soap and water and antiseptic can reduce your chances of getting it. Um, the risk of developing rabies from a rabid dog bite is approximately 30%. Uh, the vaccine is highly effective, but painful 
and short acting. It doesn't necessarily produce long term immunity. Um, but it, it, and it needs to be delivered within a few days of, uh, of the bite because like the rabies is going to take three to four months before it kills you. And so the vaccine has enough time to work before the rabies gets to your brain, but it's kind of a close thing. So it's not very reliable if it's given more than uh, a few days afterwards. Um, so there are, uh, I believe the current vaccine uses, um, five injections at the wound site intramuscularly. It used to be that they actually had a series of nine injections that had to be given into your spleen. That was not awesome. Um, there's no effective treatment. If you actually come down with symptoms of rabies, meaning that you got infected and you didn't get the vaccine or the vaccine was ineffective for some reason, there have only been six known survivors. Not six per year, not six percent, six since the discovery of rabies. So, yeah, d don't get it. All right, so that is...